Yes, you heard those lyrics correctly. He said, let's make love on the grave because I have to breed you. What's up everybody, I'm Finn McKenty. this is the Punk Rock NBA, and today we are here to talk about the inevitable. Death, taxes, and the fact that just about every successful band will probably spawn at least one kind of side project or super group or something like that, and usually with very disappointing results. I'm a fucking devil from hell. A devil from hell. But that is not always the case. There are a handful of side projects that were truly great, sometimes even surpassing the popularity of the band that originally created them. And in this video, we are gonna take a look at a few examples of the worst and the best side projects, spinoffs, and supergroups, and answer the question once and for all of, did they stand the test of time or not? But first, if you haven't, please subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications to make sure that you don't miss any of my videos. And also, I'd like to thank Keeps for sponsoring this video. Keeps is a subscription service that helps men keep their hair. It may be too late for me, but it doesn't have to be too late for you. Look, the reality is that two thirds of guys experience some kind of hair loss before the age of 35. That is actually right about when it started to hit me. And Keeps offers clinically proven, researched back treatments to stop hair loss and improve hair growth delivered straight to your door. It's so much easier with Keeps. You don't have to go to a doctor or a pharmacy, but you're still getting a doctor recommended plan at about half the cost of a traditional pharmacy. And the best part is that you'll still have 24 seven care and support. Every plan comes with a year of unlimited messaging where you can connect with your prescribing doctor about anything, anytime. Whether you wanna prevent hair loss, stimulate hair growth, or just take better care of your hair, Keeps is for you. Hair loss stops with Keeps. To get a special offer on Keeps treatments, just go to keeps.com slash punk rock or click the link in the description. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash punk rock. All right, let's start with Plus 44, Angels and Airwaves, and Boxcar Racer. The trio of Blink-182 related side projects that all kind of came out at the same time in the 2000s and were all kind of surprisingly good. And I say surprising because really, what are the odds that a three person band could create three side projects in basically like three or four years and all of them would be good? Gotta be some kind of record. Plus 44 was Mark's post-punk band, which also had Travis on drums, which in my opinion is kind of the weakest of the three, but still it's pretty good. Like better than probably 80 or 90% of other like full-time bands. My personal favorite of the three is Boxcar Racer. They only did one album, which basically came about when Tom DeLonge heard the post-hardcore band Quicksand and was like, I want to do something like that. And they got Dave from Overbind Dead Body to play guitar and kind of tried to do the post-hardcore thing. Although because it is Tom DeLonge and because it had Travis on drums, it still basically just sounds like the kind of darker, moodier, blank songs, but there's just something slightly different about it that makes me love this stuff even more than those songs. I think this album is fantastic. Super underrated. Definitely check it out if you haven't heard it. And of course, Angels and Airwaves, which was Tom DeLonge's other side project, at least originally a side project, that came out a couple years after Boxcar Racer, which came about when Tom got a delay pedal, a hollow body, and really started going down the rabbit hole of the aliens and outer space stuff. And everyone's like, oh, that song Aliens Exist? That wasn't a joke. This is awkward. <laughs> And normally anytime that punk dudes break out the delay pedals and hollow bodies, I'm out of there. But Angels and Airways, for whatever reason, it works for me. Maybe I'm just a Tom fanboy, but I don't think it's that. I think he is just that good of a songwriter that pretty much anything he touches is gonna be good. And if you kind of compare Blink before and after Tom, I think the results kind of support that. No disrespect to those guys, but it kind of speaks for itself. I mean, even the newer Angels and Airwaves stuff is really good, which I think most people would agree the the most recent Blink stuff is not. And what is the missing ingredient there? Well, it's Tom. But not every side project turns out as well as those three did. For example, Corey Taylor of Slipknot's solo album, CMFT, or Corey motherfucking Taylor. Wait a moment, this whole time I was hoping for an emotional reunion, another fucking quick moment. <laughs> 
I wouldn't say that's like the worst thing I've ever heard, but uh, you know, it's definitely not great. It's kind of like somewhere between WWE walkout music, a truck commercial, and his old band Stone Sour. I'm just gonna be honest. I think Corey Taylor is a fantastic vocalist. One of the best ever. Seems like a genuinely cool guy. If anybody out there watching happens to know him, I would say just take him aside for his own good. Do not ever let him make another solo album. One of these days, he will thank you for it. Man, you really saved me from myself. But as bad as CMFing T is, it honestly could have been much worse. It could have turned out like this band, Psycho Sinner, which is the former drummer of Five Finger Death Punch's very, 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 very bad, like industrial gothic butt rock kind of band where he dresses up like a cartoon devil and sings a lot of songs about fucking. Let's make love. Yes, you heard those lyrics correctly. He said, let's make love on the grave because I have to breed you. Huh. Well, I think we know why he got kicked out of Five Finger Death Punch, right? I mean, this makes CMFing T sound positively dignified by comparison. And by the way, it gets even worse. This is not like a one-off thing. This band put out nine albums in 2021. Nine. And I am positive that absolutely not a single person on earth was asking for nine albums of Psycho Center material, but you know what? You got it. Merry Christmas, I guess. I'm already sensing a theme here of drummer related side projects, maybe because they're stuck in the back of the band and they want a chance to kind of be in the spotlight sometimes. And you kind of think to yourself, you know what? Maybe there's a reason that you are not in the spotlight. Maybe you're not meant for that. But not all drummer side projects are bad. The ultimate example of that is Foo Fighters, which started out as a few demos that Dave Grohl made back in 1991 when he was just kind of bored and lonely on a trip back to his hometown of Virginia. And he recorded a few more songs in 92 and 93, like Exhausted and Big Me that Kurt really liked and apparently wanted to use as Nirvana songs, but obviously that didn't happen. So Dave decided to take those songs, use those as the basis for the Foo Fighters, and the rest is history. One of the biggest, and I would also say one of the best rock bands of the last 25 years. And I gotta say, as much as I kind of find the whole like online fandom of Dave Grohl kind of cringy and annoying at times, the dude is insanely talented. Talented, and although it is tragic, obviously, that we lost Kurt, Dave clearly had more potential than just being the drummer in Nirvana. He's one of those very few, super rare, like freakishly talented people that can do it all. He's an incredible songwriter, a great vocalist, a really charismatic performer with great stage presence. It's so, so rare to find people that have all three of those things. I would call him one of the all-time greats. And next up, let's talk about some super groups. A super group being any time that members of existing established bands come together to start like a new band of some kind, whether that's a side project or like a new full-time thing. And I'm always skeptical of supergroups because 90% of the time they are absolutely terrible. Like despite having four or five super talented people in the same band, for some reason they usually end up being awful. But one exception to that that I would say came out very well is Velvet Revolver, which was basically Guns N' Roses, but with Scott Weiland on vocals instead of Axl Rose. And in hindsight, I think it was pretty damn good. Like it's basically what Guns N' Roses would have and should have sounded like if Axel's ego and just general weirdness hadn't ruined the band a decade earlier. Obviously, everybody in the band is super talented and Scott Weiland is one of the very, very, very few people like on the entire planet that could possibly fill Axl Rose's shoes. They have two albums, I think. And if you're into this kind of thing, I would say check it out. If you want some top tier, like sleazy LA hard rock for those nights where you just want to tease your hair, put on some leather pants and pretend you're hanging out on sunset outside the whiskey. But a super group that did not go so well is Damnocracy, like D-A-M-N-ocracy, which first of all is a terrible name, like one of the worst names ever, straight up local band status there. Like you could totally imagine that on a flyer outside Scotty's Bar and Grill in Ashtabula, Ohio. But the band was most definitely not a local band. It was Sebastian Bach from Skid Row, Ted Nugent, Evan Seinfeld from Biohazard, Scott Ian from Anthrax, and Jason Bonham 
on drums. And it was formed for this reality show that VH1 was doing called Supergroup. My personal favorite moment from the show is Evan from Biohazard explaining the song Punishment to Ted Nugent while he's laying in bed looking just completely disinterested. It's kind of, it's kind of like this. See, I can do that. I don't know if Ted has ever heard anything like Biohazard before. It's very ominous and demonic. Very ominous and demonic. And I just kind of go into any sort of super group with low expectations, but even with that in mind, their music was absolutely terrible. Like way worse than you could have ever imagined it being with those guys in the band. <laughs> Which on the one hand is kind of surprising given how accomplished all those guys are. I mean, whether you like their music or not, I think you can agree that they have all made some objectively very good music for their genre, even if it's not necessarily your personal taste. But on the other hand, it kind of makes sense. I mean, think about having five egos of that size in the same room together. If you think about it that way, it was obviously doomed from the start, especially when two of those egos are Sebastian Bach and Ted Nugent. When you think about that, it is not hard to see why this ended up being a train wreck. I don't think heavy metal is sexy at all. And even the girls that like heavy metal are just pretty skanky and dirty. Another super group that had potential but fell prey to ego was Drugs, or Destroy, Rebuild, Until God Shows, which was Craig Owens from Chiodos on vocals with members of From First to Last, Story of the Year, Matchbook Romance, and Nick Martin, who went on to be in Sleeping with Sirens. And I wasn't expecting too much from this, A, because it was a super group, and B, because to be completely honest, I always thought Chiodos kind of sucked, and Craig Owens is a pretty limited vocalist who really didn't have a lot of musical ability, but just sort of got by on his looks and charisma, but they proved me wrong. They went into the studio with John Feldman and came out with what I would say is a really fucking good post-hardcore album. Like this is what I wanted Giotos to sound like. Really top tier stuff up there with like the used and they hit the ground running. They did Warp Tour that year. They had an AP cover. It really seemed like they might be the next big thing until kind of suddenly four out of five members, basically everybody other than Craig, like abruptly quit the band one day. And they didn't say why, but I think it's pretty obvious. Craig Owens is not the easiest person in the world to get along with. That blew the band up. And yet again, Ego got in the way and destroyed what I thought was some pretty great music. Sad to see. And speaking of frontmen, let's also talk about Audio Slave and Prophets of Rage, both of which are essentially Rage Against the Machine with different vocalists. Audio Slave was Chris Cornell from Soundgarden on vocals, and Prophets of Rage was Chuck D from Public Enemy and Be Real from Cypress Hill on vocals. And I have to say, as much as I disagree with and criticize a lot of their politics, especially Tom Morello's, I gotta give credit where it's due. Rage Against the Machine were absolutely incredible on a musical basis, like, super pioneering and groundbreaking. If you listen to their music from the 90s now, I think it still sounds super fresh and relevant. And at first I kind of chalked that up to the whole band coming together. And I think that there is some truth to that, but I didn't really realize until I heard these projects, how much of Rage Against Machine depended specifically on Zach's vocals. Because the music in Prophets of Rage could have been taken out of any random Rage Against Machine song, but by comparison without Zach, it really just sounds like very dated, corny, stale, low energy rap rock to me. The band is still as good as they ever were, but without Zach's vocals, it's really just a totally different thing. Like Prophets of Rage to me almost sounds like a local band. And to me, the takeaway is that this is why I always talk about the importance of vocals and a charismatic frontman, because this is the difference that the right front person makes. And in particular, why Zach is really one of the only people on earth that can do rap rock in a way that doesn't just sound corny. Oh yes, and one more unbelievably bad, cringy, butt rock drummer side project, Methods of Mayhem. This is Tommy Lee from Motley Crue's new metal side project from 1999, which actually is so bad, it's kind of great. Is it the most original groundbreaking thing on earth? No, it is not, but it did bring us the single greatest lyric ever uttered in all of new metal. <laughs> Yes, you heard him correctly. He said, shooting my jizzy jism. That is what you call a bar. Hobson could never. 
And honestly, as long as you're willing to kind of like turn your brain off and just accept that this is the musical equivalent of that scene from the Fast and the Furious where they jump the race car between those two buildings in Dubai, which is like clearly the most unrealistic, stupid thing ever. But you know what? It was fun to watch. As long as you can kind of keep yourself in that space, Methods of Mayhem is honestly not bad. But I do have to warn you, be careful. Listen to too much Methods of Mayhem and you just might find yourself considering getting an eyebrow piercing. Another interesting case of, I don't know whether you'd call it a side project or a super group, is Gorillas, which originally started out as just kind of like an experimental collaboration between Damien from the Britpop band Blur, you might know them from that song Girls and Boys, and an illustrator named Jamie Hewlett, who at the time was best known as the creator of the comic book Tank Girl. And the concept for Gorillas from the start was to be a virtual band, which back in 2001 was like a crazy, super groundbreaking idea. Because remember, this was 50 15 years before Hatsune Miku and Vocaloids and Travis Scott's Fortnite concert and all that stuff. And because they sort of were able to take on these virtual identities, that also enabled them to do a lot of kind of wild experimental stuff with their music that Damien felt like he couldn't do with Blur. Oh. And I'll be honest, I've always hated this band's music because to me, it just sounds like the music from a Kia commercial or something. But I do respect what they were doing conceptually. Like I said, it was very ahead of its time. And I do like their visuals a lot. The style that Jamie Hewlett was doing back then, I would say still holds up 20 years later. And you also can't argue with their success. They've sold over 25 million albums. They won a Grammy and ended up being way, way more successful than Damien's quote unquote real band Blur. And next up, yet another new metal drummer side project, Murder Dolls, which was Joey Jordison, who, as all of you probably know, was the drummer of Slipknot. It was his like horror punk side project with Wednesday 13, who is the vocalist of Murder Dolls and also a solo artist under the name Wednesday 13. Fight. Fight, fight. And I could be wrong, but I kind of feel like a lot of people didn't really like this band, probably because it's obviously a lot more punk than what most Slipknot fans were really looking for. But I thought it was pretty good. Not amazing or groundbreaking or anything, but definitely not bad. Joey's playing, of course, is fantastic as always. It's kind of interesting to hear him do something more like straightforward and stripped down than what he does in Slipknot. But I would say if you're a fan of Murder Dolls, I think Wednesday 13 solo stuff does the same sound quite a bit better. So check that out if you haven't. And on the heavier side of things, I have to give a shout out to Extremist, which is Davey Havoc and Jade from AFI's Hardcore Side Project, which kind of just came out of nowhere, I think in 2014 or so. And honestly, it's pretty damn good if you're into that sort of converged Dillinger Escape Plan kind of sound. Yeah! Very noisy and dirty and raw. And sort of an interesting little sidebar is that it's on Steve Aoki's label called Dim Mock, which might seem weird, but actually makes perfect sense because for those who don't know, Steve was a 90s hardcore kid who played in a band called This Machine Kills, which actually sounded a lot like Extremist. And last but not least, the band who arguably pioneered the whole concept of punk and metal bands doing like semi-ironic covers of pop songs, Me First and the Gimme Gimmies. And this is members of No Effects, Swing and Utters and Lagwagon doing like tongue in cheek, but clearly somewhat sincere covers of pop songs by like John Denver, Cat Stevens and Billy Joel, among many others. Ooh, baby, baby, it's a wild world. And I say that it's semi-ironic because although it's clearly kind of a joke, like they have fun with the costumes and imagery and stuff. But on the other hand, it's really well done. Like honestly, it's fucking great music. 
At first, you're like, oh, Fat Mike covering John Denver. That's pretty funny. But then you put it on and you're like, hold on. Actually, this is great and I can't stop listening to it, which is exactly what happened to me. And it might seem unexpected, but I don't think it is because guess what? Those pop songs were massive hits for a reason. Those are just fundamentally great songs in any style. And these guys did great versions of them. Is it like high art? No, it's not. They are a cover band, but I'm okay with that. I've been listening to this band since 1995 and I don't need them to be anything other than a punk cover band. All right, my friends, that does it for this video. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. And also, I would like to thank everyone who supports me on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the true cult level or above. Patrons get every podcast a week early. I do Q and A's, I do giveaways. There's members only channels in the Discord that I'm super active in. And there's also a way to have me review your music or artwork or anything else that you would like my eyes and ears on. If that sounds interesting to you, just hit the link in the description of this video. Sign up for the Patreon and follow the instructions once you sign up. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.